Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Whitwam Organics Weekly Nursery and Garden Report. My name is David Whitwam. I'm your host. Thank you so much for joining me. This week, I have a special guest. Um, we're going to get to the interview here in just a little bit. I do want to run through a brief nursery and garden report with you before I bring in my guest, uh, Kenny. And um, so what I really want to get into talking about the nursery and garden report is basically how I deal with pest pressure. I've been doing this for over 10 years and I've noticed something. The things are really cyclic. So um, last year it was white flies. We were battling white flies, not just in the nursery. Um, reports from other gardeners in some of the gardens that I had around the Tampa Bay area. Well, this spring it was fungus gnats and we've just really been um, it's it's been a huge a huge struggle i usually deal with fungus gnats somewhat with my cold winter vegetables that we are carrying into spring and i usually just kind of throw up my hands um, because the plants are kind of at the end of their cycle and if i do treat it i use products that contain bti um, that is the same active ingredient that's in mos mosquito dunks so i usually have that laying around for spot treatments when I get fungus gnats. Pro tip y'all, this is what I wanted to kind of try and get to. The reason why I think the fungus gnats got away from me is because I was using the BTI that I had purchased last year. And I, I really don't think it was good anymore. So I purchased some new stuff, uh, started using it. We And even when we keep it in the fridge. So I purchased some new stuff and we started using it and the problem is, is completely under control. So BTI is a bacteria that uh, just like its cousin, just the regular BT, um, like that's in thuricide, it's for caterpillars. Um, this particular strain is for the larva of flies. So like mosquitoes, fungus gnats. So, you know, moths, butterflies, and the gnats and mosquitoes are just completely different. Um, so they needed a different strain, but what is similar between the two of them is the organism actually has to consume it. So uh, you have to keep it in place of where the organism is feeding um, and you got to kind of wait a little while for it to work. So that's why I think the fungus gnat uh, issue got away from me. But just a pro tip, if you're using any type of biological um, organic insecticides or uh, anything like that, get it fresh. If your problem is really bad, get it fresh. I, I, I don't think a lot of this, I know when I've bought beneficial nematodes before, um, they're supposed to not even last two weeks in the fridge. So make sure your stuff's fresh so your problems don't get away from you. Uh, as far as what's going on out in our nursery of what we're planting, we're continuing to plant the uh, melons, squash, cucumbers, um, peppers, and eggplants because uh, those are a little bit more heat tolerant. Now we're still planting more tomatoes. We do run an e-commerce nursery and we have clients all over the entire country. I'm, in fact, all over the world now. Um, so you, it, it's not like back in the day, if you're an old Whitwam Organics customer and you, you could come into the nursery and buy stuff and you knew that what we were growing was just, you know, what we were going would do really well just for the Tampa Bay area. And that's not the case anymore. So we are continuing to plant out a lot of stuff that some of our Northern gardener friends might need for their gardens as well. So you can't just go on our website and buy plants any day of the year thinking that they'll work. I am working on organizing the website a little bit better so that this won't be a problem to kind of section stuff off so you'll know what to purchase and when. But if in doubt, just send us a, a message. Uh, you can do it right off of the website or uh, send us a text message or send us an email and we'll be more than happy to answer your questions. So that being said, we're still planting all of our tomatoes uh, from seed in the nursery. Um, if you're new to gardening, the really the Achilles heel for tomatoes is nighttime temperatures. That's really the temp, that's what you wanna pay attention to. You'll notice that after, depending on what types of tomatoes you're growing after about 68 to 70 degrees uh, for nighttime lows or morning temperatures, same thing. Um, the, the plants just won't put out tomatoes anymore. 
And then as you get into more heat tolerant varieties of tomatoes, that, that goes up all the way to like the Everglades tomatoes, some cherry tomatoes and Roma tomatoes, they can handle nighttime lows uh, all the way up to like 76, 78 degrees. So that's why those will carry further into the uh, summer. As a really general rule, the larger the tomato, the more likely it needs those lower nighttime temperatures um, to really put good pollen in their flowers. So you'll get flowers and no tomatoes. Now I'm not even talking about the daily rains and the blights and all the other diseases that we can get here over the summer with tomatoes. I'm literally just talking about the tomatoes setting fruit. So tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, we're still planting those out. We have starts and larger plants available for sale. Um, that's if you're in the central Florida area, South Florida area, even North Florida area, uh, for tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, you probably want to be putting in plants. Okay. Um, those are your regular, regular <laughs> types. Now we do have two, three types of eggplants that you can put seeds in for those, uh, throughout the summer. They love the heat. Um, the, uh, Winter greens, it's still not too late for the heat tolerant winter greens to get some of those going in your garden. But again, I would recommend plants, uh, not broccoli. Uh, maybe it's a little, little late, but you probably still get away with some cabbage starts. Um, and uh, collard greens and kale. I do really well with, and Swiss chard. I do really well with collards, kale, and Swiss chard all summer long. Um, I'd say if I started out with 10 plants in the spring, I might still be nursing five or six plants that we're eating off of by, by fall. I usually won't let plants continue through another. I'll kind of rip them out and start again in the fall. So that's really it. Oh, uh, I harvested a ton of onions, you guys. I found a, a, a very reliable onion. It's our Super X. Um, those we plant by seed in September or October, and we're just now harvesting them. So um, just probably harvested about 25 pounds of onions out of the just a middle section of one four foot by uh, 16 foot garden bed at one of my community garden projects. Nice, nice big onions, beautiful onions. So um, it's a short day onion. Uh, and those you can find those on our website. So um, that's it for our weekly nursery and garden report. If you have any other gardening questions, again, you can email me at info at witwalmorganics.com. And so without any more hesitation, I'm going to bring in Kenny. Hey, Kenny, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you, David, for having me. Oh, I just noticed your shirt. I love it. <laughs> got seeds. That's awesome. So, uh, so you, do you got seeds? I have a very large seed bank. Yes, I'm sure you do. <laughs> um, so I'm a hoarder. you're a hoarder a, for seeds. So, yeah, for seeds. Um, so you got a lot going on. I've been over at your house. Um, you've uh, very kindly and generously given me lots of cuttings and lots of plants over the years, um, as well as I've spoken to just countless people in our community that you've done the same thing for. Um, and you got a lot going on at your house. Why don't you tell us a little bit about all the stuff that you have going on at your homestead and kind of how did you get to that point? How did you turn your whole house into, I don't know what this is, a hobby, a sickness? I'm not too sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I moved to Tampa about eight or nine years ago and I bought my house seven years ago and I'm in the city limits. I'm very close to you, but I have an acre and a third of it's in front of our house and then two thirds of it's behind the house. And when I bought the house, it was all grass, oak trees and invasive ferns. And soon as I got here, I thought we could turn this into a permaculture paradise. Hang on, hey, do you know what kind of fern that was? Cause I know there was some talk about it. Well, it has the tubers. It's the one with the tubers on it, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, so folks, if you're pulling up ferns and they got little tubers on it, I think calling it the Boston fern is not exactly like the non-invasive one is referred to as a Boston fern as well, from my understanding. Um, and so you really can't go off of what people have called it. Um, yeah. But it's it 
it has these little, am I saying it's about the right size, right? They're about yay big. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Do you know right, if they're edible? Ahead. Do you know if the tubers are edible? I don't know. You want to try it? Um, <laughs> I just have a feeling that they are. They do so, look somewhat, they, they, they do look somewhat, somewhat edible. Yeah. Um, but I, I just wanted to be clear to people that you weren't saying like all ferns are, you know, invasive. We do have a native one that looks very similar, but the, the, the deciding factor is these little bulbous uh, tubers at the bottom of it. Yeah. So uh, we try to get rid of the ferns. Hang on, Kenny. Sorry. I forgot to tell you this. Up in your right-hand corner, there should be something that says comments. And if you click on that, you can see the comments that are coming in right now. Ah, yes. Okay. So Corey, Elker, Corey Elko said, yes, they are. And hogs love them as far as the tubers. There you go. And humans have very similar digestive systems to hogs. So we should love them too. We. <laughs> All right. I, I guess we're going to have to try that at some point. Yeah. So uh, I started watching uh, John Kohler. Okay. On uh, YouTube. He's the um, Growing Your Greens. Yeah, Growing Your yep. Greens. Yep. And that was a long time ago, eight years ago. I started thinking about permaculture. I started adding dump trucks of free mulch trimmings. Free mulch. And clippings. I started talking to Tanya Levitovic. Mm -hmm. I think I was one of the first people to join the Tampa gardening page. You and me both. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember when it was like a hundred people. Yep. And Tanya was very generous initially to me. And then that's why I was so generous to other people because I started growing these plants that were um, just easy to grow. They grew on neglect. So I added tons of um, bagged leaves. Also, somebody who was really inspiring was our neighbor. She's been at that house for 40 years. She had 10 chickens and a goose, and she had the most productive vegetable garden I've ever seen. And she would go around collecting bagged oak leaves all the time, you know, in the season, in the springtime which is the opposite of what I grew up in right. New York with. Right. So she would hoard these bags of leaves. She would pile them up and it was kind of like a feast or famine operation. She would just get as many as she could in that season. And then she slowly um, composted them over the year and she would add it. And her property is probably a foot or a foot and a half taller than everyone else's. <laughs> and she would dig into her yard and pot up a seedling or uh, ornamental, and it was really impressive. So we started mimicking what she was doing. And now I have only grass in the front yard. The entire back is mulch and leaves, and it's mixed with uh, natives, mostly perennial edibles. And then in the back corner, there's a maybe five vegetable, five raised vegetable beds for the annuals but the perennials are throughout the yard. And the reason why I have such a small annual section is because I currently have 10 chickens and three ducks, and that's the only area that they're penned off in. So it's not a time, it wasn't a time thing, because I don't know how you have time for all this, I really don't. You're a, <laughs> um, a full-time teacher, right? Yeah. At uh, Wilson uh, Middle School? Yeah. Yeah. And um, this is your, uh, let's see, when the last school you were at, Orange Grove, I believe, um, you were, what, I, I, what were you teaching there at Orange Grove? I was teaching comprehensive science, so that's physics, earth science, and biology. But as the kind of science teacher, you started a garden there, right? Yeah, I thought it would be, it would make sense for the students who are taking biology, who are learning about genetics, about Mendel's peas, about uh, interdependency, parasitism. You know, those hornworms are a great, ex a live example. Oh, yeah. So I said, I think, you know, adding a garden would be great. I looked around and I got a couple of grants. And then I asked you to build us the 
<laughs> I think four beds. Yep. And we, um, I had six classes. So each day I would take, a, we would just rotate through the classes of who got to go outside and garden for five minutes, 10 minutes um, every week. And they were solely responsible for caring for the garden. And we did perennials and annuals. And the kids would just take handfuls and handfuls of cranberry hibiscus and uh, longevity spinach. And a lot of times the middle schoolers who are 12, 13, 14, they would say they've never eaten a fresh tomato before. Right. Or they would say, um, you know, like potatoes grow on vines like above the soil. Or they would just say things that you would assume that a middle schooler should know. How right. Yes. Around. I I find the same thing with with the school gardens that I work with. So, but at that garden, were you you were the sole caretaker administrator of that garden at the school, right? Yeah. So chances are, like when you moved on to a different school, it might have. Kind it, of, yeah, it did perish a little bit. Another science teacher took it over. Okay. Great but it's very hard to grow or tend a garden when you're doing your full-time job. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, but it wasn't like a school garden. It was more of a classroom garden at the school. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and then, so now, um, yeah. So now I'm at Wilson. I moved you to started up a, uh, you started up a pretty unique for a school in the, you know, downtown yeah. Tampa area and that's an FFA program. Yeah. So when I, I got the job at Wilson because I did a um, science presentation at the museum of science and industry, Mosey in Tampa. Mm -hmm. And I was teaching about 40 or 50 other teachers. And one of the teachers was a Wilson science teacher. And at the end of my presentation, she came up to me and said, Oh, we need you at our school. So she kind of stole me from Orange Grove. And when I had my interview with the principal, I told her that I wanted to slowly get out of teaching comprehensive science because I was really more passionate about biology. Right. And I wanted to start a Future Farmers of America chapter and teach agriculture. And she approved that. So my first year I taught one agriculture class and five science classes. And then the next year I did two agriculture classes. And then last year and this year I'm teaching six agriculture classes in Hyde Park, Tampa. So down, down Tampa. And that school, um, the parents and lots of grants have been very helpful. We now have 15 raised beds for oh, annuals. Wow. Where did you put 15? You know, I'm a Wilson alumni. Yes. I, I went there. But so I know the layout. Where did you put 15 beds? I know you're your your tubs up front is that you just put more up there yeah so we have the annuals in the front of the school and then in the parking lot the staff parking lot we have probably a 20 by 30 foot butterfly garden and then also in that in the, staff, the strip of grass like between parking pretty much it's no, on the i gotta drive by and see that that's awesome you have to go into the parking lot to see it. And then also in the parking lot, we have four more raised vegetable beds for annuals. That's awesome. <laughs> Squeeze them in there. Yeah. Yeah, there so, wasn't. There so wasn't now instead, instead of having a class go out uh, sporadically, I, ha I can take all six of my classes out every day. And on Thursdays, I've... Uh, nominated myself as the recycling team. So one class does the recycling for the entire school, which is about 40 teachers, three floors. But on that day, on Thursdays, I email all the teachers and I say, I have eight heads of cabbage, 15 cuttings of basil, 20 carrots, um, you know, a handful of tomatoes, who wants it? So then when the kids are doing the recycling, they go around and they deliver fresh organic produce to the teachers. Oh, that's amazing. That's great. So um, you said the kids in middle school are taking an agriculture class. 
like what is that what does that count for for them yeah so that's another reason why the principal was excited for me to start this program mm -hmm. in sixth grade it's an elective okay and so you know i'm competing with band and orchestra and right. art and then in seventh grade and eighth grade it's also an elective but in seventh grade they can take a certificate which is from the state and it earns the school $450 for each kid who passes. I'm sure they and, like that. <laughs> yeah, the, the school and the school district love that, but the kids like it because in seventh grade, it's the first thing that can appear on their high school transcript. So no other subjects do that. And then if they take agriculture in eighth grade, they can get a different certificate, which is also on their high school transcript, and it counts as a science elective, or not an elective, it counts as a science credit, and they need four credits to graduate high school. So if they take my class and then the advanced science class, they already have two of the four science credits they need before they even enter high school. That's amazing. So it, so does it, does it knock out an elective credit for them and a science credit at the same time? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and it counts as a honors credit. Oh, wow. So just for anybody who doesn't know what the heck we're talking about, we're talking about the future farmers of America. And yeah. um, what I think is really cool about that is it's not, you're not just teaching these kids agriculture, right? Because I mean, from, from which before I was deeply exposed to it, that's what I thought it was. Mm -hmm. But it's so much more than that. So like, what are some of the non agri like direct agriculture related yeah. things that, you, that you're teaching these kids? So it's not just about farming. Agriculture is about leadership mm -hmm. and starting your own business. It's also about uh, food systems. So how does the milk go from the cow to the fridge? What is pasteurization? Now this year has been really bad because of COVID, but in previous years, we would make ice cream, we would make cheese. We did a couple of carnivorous plant bog installations at the University of South Florida's uh, botanical gardens. So we did some, you know, work. We did some field trip work. We went to Seagrest Fish Farms, which is in Riverview. It's the largest uh, pet fish nursery in probably the world. So, I have a poster in my office that is a big picture of Florida and it, it it's got all the um, all the crops of or things mm. that we produce as agriculture in yeah. the state. And some of them I look at and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, tomatoes. That's there. And the, I, like I recognize, OK, out in the Gulf grouper. Yeah, I've seen that one. The one I was shocked about was what a heavy producer we are of tropical pet fish. Yeah, I was blown away so by that. So when we, the kids loved that field trip because it was like going to a, you know, a pet store, but the cooler thing was that they said that if you've ever seen a fish at a pet store, it went through them. Mm -hmm. They ship out 1 million fish a week. Wow. Over 90% of them are captive raised in Florida. And there is like seven to 10% that are wild caught and they maybe five or 10 years ago, they actually had a hundred percent captive raise and they got rid of all the wild caught ones. But then they were asked to go down to Brazil and different parts of the Amazon and see how it negatively affected the indigenous people by not purchasing these fish that are abundant in the Amazon. So they've decided to, you know, stick with like five to 7% of fish from the Amazon. Gotcha. And if you go to their website, it's it's kind of inspirational about how um, you would think that you want all captive fish, but it's inspirational how they're still helping those people because that's how their livelihood um, that's their job. You know, is based on. Yeah. And uh, so, so in my class, the kids are learning about aquaponics. I have two uh, 10 gallon aquariums that grow microgreens. And then we have fish, like tropical fish, goldfish in the bottom, and their waste nut gives nutrients to the crops. We uh, learn different cow and pig breeds. They volunteer at the state fair when there isn't a worldwide pandemic. 
Sure. Um, the other thing is they learn like interview skills, resume building. So y'all have a big present when presence at the fair when the fairs when the fairs going on. Like, what have you done? So you've been doing this for how many years at Wilson? Two. This is my Three? fourth year at Wilson, but this is only my second year with six classes of agriculture kids. But you had the FFA there three years ago? I, yeah, three years, yep. So obviously not this year. Yeah, so, so the previous years. <laughs> one year, so you have one year to do the fair? Yes. <laughs> you have one year to do the fair, then the pandemic, and then this year we may, has the fair been canceled yet? The fair is gonna happen in a couple of weeks, but children will not be handing out orange slices and strawberry right. shortcake. All the fun stuff. Yeah. So last year that my students, I brought maybe 30 of them and they worked two different shifts, a morning and a PM. So if you worked the morning and the PM, they got to ride the rides and eat horrible food or vice versa. Wonderful, horrible food. Yeah. So the kids, my kids taught um, the patrons how to make butter. From, oh, in the, um, in the plastic bottle thingy? Yeah. Yeah, I they like that. They taught them uh, what byproducts are from cows. They uh, showed kids how to grow a radish seed, how to juice the oranges. So they were in the Ag Ventures okay. building. Mm -hmm. That's what they worked, yeah. Gotcha. So, but you don't... Um, your FFA club at the school, don't you guys hold, you hold elections every year and have a whole entire student board, like with a president, yeah. vice president. Um, so I'm assuming now, so you have your agriculture classes in your, in your FFA club, right? They're separate yes. still? Okay. Well, the FFA wants a hundred percent participation from the agriculture students. So if you're in the class, you're automatically a FFA member. Oh, okay. But it, that doesn't mean that they show up to the monthly meetings. Gotcha. But you're right. You and uh, two other people in the Tampa area have interviewed. Mm -hmm. Very, the kids were very, you know, formal. They dressed up, suit and oh, tie, yeah. dress, you know, uh, dresses. And um, you and two other people interviewed the people who were interested in being a board member. An officer. I mean, I guess they, that, that's what really drove it home to me that the FFA was not just teaching these kids about agriculture. Yeah. Like the the, the level of life skills that they're walking away from this. Uh, like I didn't, I guess, ever really realize how much it's, how much it's student run like mm -hmm. that. Um, so do they go on, uh, do they decide what field trips they go on and stuff like that? Or is that being at a public school kind of kept really tight? Uh, other than this year, yes. They, they drive the food that we grow, the field trips that we attend, um, places that we donate to. So you have chickens at home, right? Yeah, I have 10 chickens at my house. You're, so no chickens at Wilson? Legally, we can have chickens. You but can or can't? We can, uh huh, but because of land, the whole campus is buildings, right? Um, Put it on the roof. We have, <laughs> yeah, we have a lot. So because we're in downtown uh, Tampa, we have classroom pets. So in previous years, we had guinea pigs, uh, bearded dragon, the fish, carnivorous plants. Last year, we got a miniature toucan. What? Yeah. I but, didn't know there was a miniature toucan. Oh, yeah. It's called the R. Sorry. And um, yeah, so this year, unfortunately, nothing's in the classroom. Gotcha. And that's just because of the need to handle them and keeping the kids a little more separate or. Yeah. And when there's a positive case of COVID in the classroom, they they kind of spray bomb the classroom and they over sanitize surfaces and that would be very detrimental to the fish and the bird. And so where are all the animals right now? They are at students' houses. Oh, okay. Throughout, so not all, through, you're at, you didn't get stuck with them all? I know. Okay. 
<laughs> I thought that it would be a little much if I had to work nine hours and then come home and take care of all the yeah, classroom pets. all the classroom pets. So, but you do have to take care of your chickens. You said you have ten chickens. Yeah, I have ten chickens and uh, three ducks. And when I just two years ago in 2019, I started keeping track of how much um, chicken food was, how many eggs I produced. And every single piece of fruit and vegetable that I grew on my land. Oh, cool. And at the end of 2019, I was very disappointed on how much food I was harvesting, not growing. I was growing so much, but I just wasn't harvesting it or eating it. So that was really eye opening. And then in 2020, I did a lot better. What do you think? What do you think your hinge pin was? Like, what do you think was the, the, the missing link? You said you were growing plenty of it, but you weren't using it. Yeah, I was watching Rob Greenfield and uh, John Kohler, and I was like so inspired, and I was just planting seeds and watching things grow, and then I would just watch it grow and grow, and then I would say, okay, I'm going to the grocery store. So, but that's what I mean. Like, what was the holdup yeah. at that point? Was it that you hadn't anticipated? That was, I'm kind of a leading question there because I yeah. kind of think I might have experienced the same thing. And that's, there's a hidden learning curve that I don't even think most people even get to is that once you get to a point where you're even producing food, getting mm -hmm. dirty plants out of the garden and into your kitchen and processing them to a point where you can actually eat them, it's like another hour. And if yes. you have a whole busy day and you grew the food and you got to harvest it and you're hungry, I guess mm -hmm. the processing part is what, what yeah. blindsided me. And I'm wondering, is yeah. that the same thing you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. So in 2019, I went to the Tampa gardening swap page Yep. and I saw somebody giving, well, so I needed to figure out how to harvest everything. So I, um, went to the Tampa gardening swap page and I saw somebody giving away the giant pot for canning. You know what I mean? Like the big pot where you put all your cans. Yeah. And I, she was giving away like 40, 50 Mason jars plus the canning machinery and the funnels. So I got all of that. And then this year somebody was giving away a dehydrator. So I got that. And once you have the canning things, you can ferment, uh, pickle, make salsa. Dive them. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> my, my parents, who I know are watching this, they have no experience with any of those things. And we started doing, they're in New York, but when they would come to visit, we would do these mass um cleaning of the vegetables, processing, preserving. Because I was, I was aware that people waste one third of all their groceries. So when you know you go grocery shopping, can you imagine having three bags and dropping one in yeah. the parking lot? Right. And then just keep walking? No, you, of course not. So, but because people uh, let food spoil, they keep it in the back of the fridge, they don't eat everything on their plate. One third of all food is wasted. And then I started taking, uh, I'm getting my master's degree in three weeks in global sustainability. Nice. Which further enlightened me on how we have this food problem. So then in 2020, I took it seriously and I started dehydrating, pickling, freezing. Freezing is such an easy one. It and really is. It does take an hour to clean your produce. And I realized how much water is used in the food system. It's not just watering your crops. I use so much water cleaning the crops. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So uh, I'm, I'm reading the comments. Corey died of botulism once. That's very sad. <laughs> Corey. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what, like, what do you think? I'm with you on that. Um, pretty much when I'm growing a new vegetable in the garden, one of the first things I always do with it um, is I take it and I freeze it just yeah. as is. I wash it off a yeah. little bit. I throw it in the freezer. If I take it out and it's nasty, um, you know, then I try maybe cooking that a couple different ways. Try it in soup. And then if that's still not working, then I try it at a couple different levels of blanching at first. 
<laughs> like if I could just take it raw, I found that the long beans and okra, mm -hmm. you could just throw them straight into the freezer. Yeah. Uh, Swiss chard, if you're going to cook with it, I do know people that will like make smoothies out of it. Kale, if you're going to make smoothies out of it, just put it in the freezer. You don't have to do anything to it, but maybe pre-wash it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what's the next step up as far as, because you're like, you're 10 laps in front of me on, on the preserving and preservation and preparing of food. I would say way down here is fermentation, right? Mm -hmm. And then somewhere in there is canning. Is there anything in between canning and freezing as far as easier preserve, like heart, I, I, a little more difficult than just throwing yeah. it in the freezer or blanching it and then maybe a little easier than canning? Or is that the next? Oh, dehydrating. I, right? yeah, I was going to say, I did find that um, dehydrating like moringa leaves and mint and maybe some other leafy greens. That was actually a little tricky. I, when I put it on the clothesline in, in a bedroom or when I put it outside, I noticed that some of them, they were losing leaves rather than staying on the stem right. before um, they were ready to be harvested or they, or one section would stay wet and then that whole area would get mold or fungus. And it's just to. too humid here. Yeah. So that's why I, I, um, I talked to my friend MJ Clark and she's kind of near uh, Woodrow Wilson Middle School. And she puts everything in her bathroom, in her air-conditioned or heated house. She puts like a big blue tarp in her, in her not used, in her second tub. And then she hangs everything over it. And if you do it right with like a fan, um, they shouldn't come off, like I'm talking about Moringa right uh -huh. now, but they shouldn't come off the stem. And then in maybe three to seven days, they're fully dried. And when she's watching TV, she just has a big brown grocery bag in front of her. And she's pulling off the leaves off the stems. And then she just takes her hand, crushes up. Then she puts it in a blender. And I know people like listening now are probably thinking like, oh, wow, this is like a hour of processing. But yeah. I will say that four um, tea bags of Moringa is sixteen ninety nine at the health food store. Yeah, it's very expensive. And you can just ask somebody who grows moringa for a branch and stick it in the ground, and it will grow a new tree. It's very easy to grow. The processing part, it's a little, it's mm -hmm. definitely a little in, involved. Um, if you want it dried, if you want it fresh, it's a little spicy. But I can eat it spicy with um, in a soup or stew. Do you find, do you have any um, ideas on uh, that spicy taste? Like, because I think to really get the health benefits of it, that's why drying it is so good because you need to eat a lot of it. Yeah. I mean, you can't just be sprinkling some fresh leaves on your on your eggs in the morning. I mean, that's better than nothing. Um, but you need you need a lot of it in your food. Any, any tips on spices you use or anything you use to try and cut that flavor? Or do you just get used to it? Like garlic. Okay. Yeah, you can get used to it. But I like spicy food as well. So I can eat it raw, like yeah. right off the tree. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so the, I, so the next step would be dehydrating. And you got mm -hmm. you said you got a dehydrator? You don't yeah, do the moringa in the dehydrator too much? I haven't done moringa. I've just done bananas because when the bananas come in, you that, have rack is, that rack is so big you have to process them. I've done like apples, pears, bananas. Ooh, I also like to do hot peppers and I've done tomatoes. The hot peppers are good. Yet? I have not done mangoes. My mango tree is loaded right now. I'm like, I got a dehydrator for Christmas. Okay. Um, a nice, a nice big four tray yeah. dehydrator. Yeah. And like, I'm super excited about, I did some strawberries when we got a bunch of big flush on strawberries and then um, I, when the mangoes come in, because when you start getting into some of these fruits, it's like, it's all or nothing. Yeah, I was watching your uh, Paul Zamoda video earlier today. Mm -hmm. And I see Paul says hi. So hi, Paul. Yeah, Paul's in here. Hey. Um, and I also, so in 2020, when I started keeping track of how much food I was producing, I started advertising it on my Facebook page, Critter Companions. And that made me conscious of like, 
showing people like, look how much I can grow in this small space because my, my annual garden is small. But then I also was thinking what, um, I thought of this, but then Paul reminded me when I was watching the video today of when people, you know, hunters and gatherers, they would just eat all the strawberries in the, in the season. And then they would move on to the next food group. Yep. And that was my mentality definitely in 2020. Like I'm okay. I have bananas now, so I'm going to eat bananas every day, at least once a day. Right. And then once I get through that, then I move on to the next food group. I really think that that's like the key to being more healthy. I mean, yeah, I don't know seasonally. if I mentioned this with Paul. I probably did because this is my anecdotal theory. Is that if you eat a lot of something you're going to get all the good stuff out of it and then you go long periods without eating it again it gives your body time to process out anything that is negative for you mm -hmm. it's just when we eat a little bit of the same thing every four days forever the bad stuff builds up and we're not really getting the benefits of it i i yeah. just the way our livers and our bodies work that's that just makes a lot of sense to me and especially if that's how people ate for whatever you believe a hundred thousand yeah. years, 300,000 years, whatever that number is, it's a long time yeah. compared to how long we've been eating the way we're eating right now. Mm -hmm. um, what's this Daria saying about fermenting zero mold with Mason tops? Yeah, I have, um, I have the same thing. That's what I use. I use those. Um, there's a little uh, like ceramic weight. And then it looks like a nipple that has like the small hole that lets um, the ferment out, but it doesn't let fresh oxygen in. And then that prevents the mold. So it's super easy if you get the right kit. Yeah, it costs $10 for six. It's good for six mason jars. And you can reuse these mason jars after you're done with them, right? You just wash mm -hmm. them and sterilize them and... Yeah. Yeah, the... One of the easiest ways that I sterilize it is in the dishwasher. And then immediately when it comes out of the dishwasher, I use it. I have not, I've done everything. I've done kimchi, pickled radishes, pickled beets, um, salsa, lo lots of things, you know, cu cucumber, zucchini, and I've never had a problem. Have you done pickled eggs yet? You got a lot of chickens. Okay, I don't like hard-boiled eggs. <laughs> Especially pickled ones? I don't think I would like so that. What no. do you do with your excess eggs? I'm sure with 10 chickens, you have way too many eggs sometimes, and chickens don't lay for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. So what do you do? Just eat a lot of eggs when they're going and not eat eggs when, they're, when they stop? Well, I would definitely agree with you that 10 chickens is way too many chicken. Well, the ducks... Or I have two Pekin ducks, which are the big white ducks, and they are more productive than the chickens. The Pekin ducks are about a year and a half old right now, and they literally lay six to seven eggs a week. Holy crap. And the chickens, who are between the ages of one year and four years, they lay two to five eggs a week. Each, each chicken? Each. Okay. So... Probably for the past year, I have been getting probably three to eight eggs a day. And that that's is too many. That's a lot of eggs. That's too many for two people. Yeah. And thankfully, I work with 40 teachers who all love fresh farm eggs. And I charge um, $5 for two dozen, which is a very good price for free range chickens. That's a really and good price. It just covers the chicken food. I love I love coming home and feeding the chickens, having yeah. the chickens like run and greet me. So I understand that they're a utilitarian. I, miss our, I do miss our chickens. I really do. My whole family misses our chickens, but we also don't miss having to get a house sitter when we go out of town. You know, we have dogs and cats, but we can like yeah. take them play. Well, the cats are all outside cats, but dogs, we can take them and mm -hmm. drop them off at somebody's house while we're gone for a week. You can't do that with your chickens. Yeah. I will say that if you have two chickens or 10 chickens, it still requires the same number of pet sitters. Exactly. Yeah. 
it's a shame that you can't get chickens at the school to have the kids learn, you know, the mm -hmm. full the full deal with you know buying the chicken feed. You could even get them to reduce the cost of that by taking more scraps and feeding them, therefore reducing the amount and increasing. There's a whole layer of of teaching mm -hmm. them. Like chickens yeah. are just great at schools. Everybody talks about mm -hmm. every school needs a garden. I think every school that can have them needs needs chickens. And to do the whole thing of like getting the eggs, selling them back to the parents and the teachers, mm -hmm. figuring out how to make it at least float itself, if not slightly prop. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a lot to teach the kids in there. For yeah. sure. Chicken math. Chicken math is a powerful thing. Yeah. If you go to my website, uh, KennyCoogan.com, I have a chicken channel, which is 20 different videos. Each of them are about four to five minutes long. And one of them is about chicken math and poultry math. Yes. That's um, awesome. I will say that two years ago, one of my students who was, can you be an Eagle Scout in eighth grade? Maybe. I think so. Okay. Well, he did, he built a three bin compost at our school. Uh-huh. So my students do take the cafeteria scraps and we do compost. At what do school. you mix them with? Just oak leaves from the neighborhood? Yeah. That's that's the best thing that we got going on here in the Tampa area is all these oak trees. Yeah. Um, somebody in the comment section wants to know what I feed the chickens. And um, in your blurb about me, it says that I've been writing for national magazines for the past 10 years. And I've published over 400 articles on about half of them are about chickens and the other half are about homesteading and you know, growing your own food. And I talked to you about John Kohler a couple of years ago. I interviewed him and we made it on the cover of Countryside. Right. Country, Countryside also owns Backyard Poultry. And these are all subscriptions. So you'd have to subscribe for you to get it. But I also write for Hobby Farm and Chickens. And I interviewed Tiffany Thiessen, star of Saved by the Bell. Nice. And she raises uh, maybe six chickens, but she has an acre and she has lots of food. So I've been growing or raising chickens and ducks for over 20 years. And up until maybe five or six years ago, um, because I worked at zoos, the veterinarians would always say the only animal that we actually know what it needs to eat is a chicken. Like we kind of know like bears, they eat fish and they eat fruit. But because the chicken is so... Um, industrialized. That's the only thing we know exactly what it needs on day one, on day 15, and month three, like the chicken, you know, all these um, formulated feeds like Purina Laina, or um, there's many other brands, they know exactly what to feed a chicken. So up until like five or six years ago, I would only feed them that. I wouldn't like feed them any scraps. But then I started thinking about other countries and how chickens are kind of just eating scraps and they're getting yep. by and how a chicken can really be a tool on your homestead. Absolutely. They can, they can be the composter, they can be the fertilizer, they can be um, the meat or the eggs, you know, so probably five or six years ago, I went like the exact opposite way. I started feeding them so much food scraps and having them forage more. They've always been free ranged and on an acre, you can imagine they eat a lot. Like I've seen them, our neighbor, I've seen our neighbor's chicken hunt down a mouse. <laughs> and once the chicken had it in its beak, all the other chickens started chasing that. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah they're out the of lizards, mice, roaches. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's their candy is roaches. Yeah, I've also seen the chicken eat not our chicken, also the neighbor's chicken, eat a, eat a black racer. And a, yep. like a day or two ago, our chicken started surrounding this black racer, you know, this three foot snake, and they were about to go for it if um, we didn't walk there, by there, and scare the snake. There are the two, two animals, I think, for, for like urban homesteading, if you can get them, that I think everybody should get are um, rabbits and chickens. And the reason yeah. why is because they both can um, convert things that would have been previously a waste into something that's usable extremely quickly. Rabbits, 
you can take all your weeds that you would have maybe not even wanted to put in your compost pile. Since I don't have my rabbits anymore, there's so many more weeds in my backyard. Not that we let the rabbits free range, but when we would feed them weed scraps, the rabbits loved them so much that every time you came out in the backyard, they'd come to the edge. You knew what they were looking for. They wanted weeds. And so it got to the point you weren't weeding your garden. You were feeding the rabbits treats. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you just naturally are now weeding and weeding, feeding those rabbits treats. And the next day, if not the same day, you have little turds that can go in your garden right then. You can't do that with composting. Yeah. You can't turn weeds into something to grow food with the next day. Rabbits are good at that. And then, of course, chickens, what you were talking about, they're garbage disposals. Yeah. So I feed my chickens. I have 10. I have a. Uh, all standard breeds, so they're pretty big, like five to 10 pounds. And then the ducks are huge. They're probably 10 or 12 pounds. I feed them one coffee can of chicken feed, which is, you know, like eight cups, maybe. No, not, yeah, probably A small eight cups. coffee can or a big coffee can? No, small. A small one, okay. And then that lets them eat. They have food until about three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Like that's how long it takes them to eat that because they're also eating weeds and snakes and bugs. And then um, after they eat that, I give them everything except for alcohol and salty foods. Right. They can eat meat. They eat vegetables, fruits. They also, I have three compost um, bins made out of pallets at my house and they will fly up into the compost bin and scratch around, you know, kitchen waste. And recently, I know you talked about it last week, about how like lots of the leafy greens are bolting right now. I give them all of those things and they eat the seeds, the seed pods, the flowers, the, they eat everything except like the super hard stem. So I feel good that, you know, I was able to eat it and then the chickens are taking care of it. Now, so, let me, let me tell let me tell you what I my experience is with the chickens, and you tell me if you kind of found the same thing. When I first got chickens, because I had previously, for years, purchased organic fertilizers for my garden that were chicken poop based, right? <laughs> so yes. I thought I was going to get all this chicken poop. I got all these chickens. I'm going to get all this chicken poop for my garden. I'm going to take it. I'm going to put it in the compost bin, and it's going to break down. Where does the chicken poop go? Like mm -hmm. it's nowhere to be found. Yeah. <laughs> it just disappears when you're so, free ranging your chickens. Yeah. Um, I, in the past two years, I started a carnivorous plant nursery out of my house. And whenever somebody comes over, I have to warn them of the chicken craters. So they are going to the bathroom. They have, you know, two thirds of an acre. They're it's around. It's just not collectible in these yeah. massive amounts. I mean, yeah. I guess I if you kept them in a pen where mm -hmm. they were just sitting there pooping on top of poop and you had to clean the pen out regularly, yeah. you'd get a bunch of chicken. But if you're like even halfway free ranging them. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult. It's not what I thought it would be. Let's put it that way. <laughs> the hence the rabbits and the rabbit poop. Yeah. So the chickens and the ducks, they do go in a coop slash shed at night and I clean and the the substrate is hay and I clean that once a week and that is a because there's so many birds it's 13 birds I collect that and I put the hay and the chicken or poultry manure in the compost and then it's still six weeks eight weeks later until it breaks down so until are your six. ducks are your ducks dry ducks I think is the terminology, right? Am I getting that yeah. right? Yeah. In um, August, August through October, when it's the rainy season, they have a 30 foot by 10 foot by two foot deep pond. It's an ephemeral pond. That's right. That's uh, what flooded your yard that year, isn't it? Yeah. But now, oh God, now I we totally have forgot about that. Now we use the sump pump. But, oh, I got you. Okay. But, because of the ducks, we do leave it. So it's a very, it's a pretty big pond and they love to swim in it. The rest of the year, they swim in a kiddie pool. Okay, so you that. have a little pool for them? Yeah, that's just a kiddie pool. It, um, cost me, it cost me 97 cents 
at Toys R Us. And then later that month, Toys R Us went out of business. So your your but your chickens and your ducks live together. They they sleep in separate pens. Okay. But, but they range together. They range together. Any problems with raising chickens with ducks or um the, yeah, the only main problem is that ducks need water to eat. So you can't just give them dry right. um, late Purina Laina. What they do is they like take the food and put in the water, put the water in the food, and they mix it up, and it's really they make a mess. A mash. They're <laughs> very messy. They make a mess. But um, you know, I you know the aquaponics thing I have back here mm -hmm. started out as a quackuponics. <laughs> because I back when I had ducks, I had um, I needed to build a. Well, I had the kiddie pool, and then I graduated to a bigger thing and basically set up a small aquaponics system for the ducks, and for the duck poop water and the food water. You know, from them doing their food, would go through and circulate around and feed the plants, just like a, just like a regular aquaponics system, mm -hmm. but with um, the. And it, it's great. I, did, I got to the point where I didn't have to change the water out anymore because the plants and my rock system really did filter the water out. Mm -hmm. It worked. Yeah. So the I, I love the duck's personality and that they're providing eggs. This is a Polish. Polishers are the chickens with the really fluffy feathers on the top. So this is a Polish egg, and this is a duck egg. <laughs> and... They eat very similar. I've heard they're better for baking. What is that? What is that? Um, where's they that? Higher, is that true? They have a higher fat content. Okay, that's what it is. So they're richer, yeah. This is a um, this is a naked neck egg and the Polish egg. And then every once in a while, you get a freeloader. They lay these. That? They. This is a, also a chicken egg, but young birds. They sometimes um, their systems are kind of catching up with themselves, and these are called fairy eggs or fart eggs. So it takes twenty five hours for them to produce an egg, but every once in a while their system gets off whack and they can lay two eggs in a day. But then that second egg is like a fairy egg, so a smaller one. Yeah, you can eat it, but you and it's like it's a little bigger than a quail egg. Have you got into any um, chicken husbandry? What about the husbandry? Have you gotten into any? Have you ever tried it? Like getting a rooster and raising the, you know, hatching the eggs and raising the chicks. The the full the full cycle with the chickens. Yeah, our neighbor has a rooster, so we could do the fertilized eggs. Um, not at this house, but at my uh, previous house, we did have roosters, and we would raise the um, we would raise the chickens from egg to adulthood. Have you done that with the kids at the school? Not at this school, but you're right; they would love it. They would, but you're done there um, soon, correct? Maybe you're moving on to something else, uh, yes. another adventure. Yes, and I know um, we, I don't have anything. I have four plans in my mind, and I know that I will be joining you in one month on May 5th, and maybe then I will have an update. Okay, but, um, but regardless, because um, you've been slinging them on the side for quite some time, why don't you tell everybody about your little side hustle possibly not going to be a side hustle. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned it before and I wanted, I actually wanted to stop you, but I knew we were going to talk about it at the end. You were talking mm -hmm. about doing carnivorous plants with the kids at a bog setup where I forgot. At, at the, at USF, at the botanical so, gardens there. So are there at the botanical gardens? So are there native carnivorous plants to Florida? Yes. And I, I don't right. know if you know this, but I wrote a 112 page book on Florida's carnivorous plants, and it will be coming out December 2021. Nice. Uh, so just for people, I'm always assuming, what are we talking about carnivorous plants here? Like yeah. pitcher plants, plants, Venus flytrap, stuff like that? 
Mm -hmm. Florida has the most carnivorous plants out of all of the states. We have 34 different species. Two years ago in my um, fellowship at USF, I, I wanted to teach the kids about carnivorous plants. And I contacted the International Carnivorous Plant Society, and I became the education director of that society. And then during COVID, I started my master's degree. I was teaching 10 classes, and I wrote a 112-page book about carnivorous plants, which is coming out later. And uh, it kind of, you know, it's aligned with my carnivorous plant nursery. So in Florida, we have things, we have plants that eat bugs that live in the water solely. So they're fully aquatic. They eat mosquito larvae and tadpoles. We have um, pitcher plants, which are these, you know, cylindrical pitchers that grow up from the ground that catch um, a little bit of rainwater, but mostly they have digestive enzymes that uh, I slow down. Were all tropical. I, I thought those were all imported. No. And when you told me a long time ago you were into carnivorous plants, I was like, what is he doing getting into these? <laughs> yeah, the ones that people have hanging that are vines, those are from Asia. Okay. But the ones that are upright, um, the North American pitcher plants, which are called Saracenia, they are absolutely native. We have the most uh, species out of all the U.S. We also have things that are like flypaper. And I know in the very beginning of this, you were talking about like fungus gnat problems. Mm -hmm. We do have sundews and butterworts that could could eat fungus gnats and fruit mm -hmm. flies and things like that. But at my uh, nursery, I have over a thousand carnivorous plants for sale. And so this is a tease, guys. So this is going to be on what, May 5th? Yeah. Wednesday. May 5th? And why did you choose that day? So May 5th is going to be the inaugural World Carnivorous Plant Day. And I and the conservation director, Carson Trexler, are curating it. So we've contacted people from all over the world. And the plan is every hour on the hour for May 5th, we're going to be releasing a five to 15 minute video from scientists, researchers, hobbyists about how to grow them, about their conservation status, about um, new species that have been discovered. But people who are tuning into Whitwam Organics get the actual education director, me. Yes. So we're going to have a 45 minute to an hour and a half long talk just on carnivorous plants, y'all, on May 5th. Uh, yeah. We have gone uh, for today. We are right at about an hour, Kenny. Um, yeah. And I just want to make sure that we got that teaser in there for for next week because I'm really looking forward to it. I'd say I know nothing about carnivorous plants except for, you know, the Venus flytrap and a little bit about the pitcher plant. But like I said, I'm, I thought they were all tropical. I had no idea that we had Florida natives. So I'm really excited about that show. Uh, everybody who's tuning in again, we're going to be back talking strictly about carnivorous plants, uh, focusing some on carnivorous plants of Florida. Um, I'd like that to be the bulk of our, our talk, but I'm sure you have so much other things to talk about with the carnivorous plants and around the world being that May 5th is the first, right? Is that what you said? The yeah. first international? World Carnivorous Plant Day. World Carnivorous Plant Day. And we're going to be celebrating by having Kenny back on who's one of the big dogs of the organization. Um, thank you so much, Kenny, for joining me. Um, everybody, if you'd like to get in touch with Kenny, um, in the video's description, there's um, his website, his Facebook page, uh, Kenny at Critter, wait, facebook.com slash Critter Companions, um, as well as, uh, let's see, we got your Facebook page, your website. Oh, and a link if you would like to uh, check out and buy his book, 99 and a Half Homesteading Poems. Well, again, thank you so much for joining me, Kenny. Everybody, uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And um, I will see you guys next week with another topic and another weekly nursery and garden report. Thanks, Kenny. I'll thank see you guys you later. Much. Bye.